On today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Josephine Perry, a qualified and regulated sport and exercise psychologist. The episode is going to be super useful for you, regardless of which area of psychology you are passionate about. There's loads of useful tips and guidance for performance and mindset. And if you stay tuned right to the end, you might find some interesting tips you've also not considered in the past. Hope you find it so useful. It is slightly longer than usual. Uh, about about 45 50 minutes but it's well worth every second enjoy hi welcome along to the aspiring psychologist podcast i'm dr marianne trent and i'm a qualified clinical psychologist today we have a slightly longer than usual episode and we're going to be talking with dr josephine perry um she's incredibly inspiring to speak with and i feel really humbled and honored that she gave us her time so freely and it was such a pleasure to speak with her. I hope you'll find it useful. I'll look forward to catching up with you on the other side. Hi, welcome along to today's episode. I'm really very excited to introduce you to Dr. Josephine Perry. Dr. Josephine is a sport and exercise psychologist and also an author. Welcome along, Josephine. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for saying yes. I'm really excited to meet you and to get to know you and to help um, our audience learn more about you and your work, your books and your career. So what is a sport and exercise psychologist? Let's start there. So we are trained, I guess, officially in mental skills. Um a lot of us now call ourselves performance psychologists because we don't just work in sport and exercise. Um, I have clients who are medics, who are entrepreneurs, um, who are DJs, opera singers and lots of athletes. And it is about helping someone get the absolute best out of themselves. Um, so that might be through workshops in clubs and I'll go into lots of sports clubs or work with sports scholars in schools. Um, to help teach some kind of general elements. We might be working on how to max out your motivation or how to handle performance anxiety. And then I also work one-on-one with people to really focus on their specific elements, what might be holding them back from where they want to get to. How do they keep going? I I work a lot in endurance sports um, and my background's endurance sports. So I work a lot with people about how do you manage to do a 100-mile run? got some doing a 100 mile ultra this weekend it's like how do you keep going for 100 miles when every part of your body is screaming no um so it's a complete mix um of working with teams helping the teams get better working together and those individuals within the teams and then also working with individuals and helping them get the most out of themselves amazing it sounds like a fascinating area and i'm intrigued to see how I get beyond three kilo, three kilometers in a run, <laughs> let alone a hundred miles. So, hats off to your clients. That's you know really really impressive stuff. How did you get into it? So I had a co- previous career um, as a communications director, and so until 2013, I was working for a company called or a charity actually called Nuffield Health. Um, which was lovely because I was working in the fitness, the health world, um, but but running communications, running campaigns to get people more active. Um, but my, my heart was in Ironman racing. So I was doing long distance triathlons with my husband. And we went over to Australia to do Ironman Melbourne. And I was standing on the beach in Frankston, which is where the swim start is there. And the waves looked horrific. And I was really, really scared. And the guy on the tannoy said, you can't control those waves. You can only control how you feel about them. And it was it was proper light bulb moment stuff of me going, ah, if I used my brain, I could be a lot better at this sport stuff. Because I was always the really geeky academic kid at school. And I was always last out of the changing rooms to ever do any sports. Um, and I suddenly realized I could be a lot better at sport if I actually used my brain a bit more. And I got in the water and I did the swim and I had my fastest Ironman race um, probably ever because I can't see me going back to it. And um, when I got back to the UK afterwards, I really started looking into sports psychology. And I think at the time there was probably only Steve Peters book 
around the chimp paradox and there wasn't really that much else and there wasn't really much information on how to get into it but I wasn't enjoying my job at all and I had the ability to go and my husband said we'll just have a year off have a gap year and I was like yeah yeah I'll do that so I, I quit the job and and within two weeks I was bored so um, I went to do a master's in psychology a conversion course and with the idea being that well that would always help understanding behavior change if you understand behavior better that's going to help me understand behavior change I can go straight back into communications it will be helpful but with the idea that that maybe I could pick up the sports side too and I enjoyed that um, so I signed up for a master's in sport and exercise psychology um, it's usually a one-year course um, and then I discovered at the end of that, if you actually want to be a sport and exercise psychologist, it's another three years training. I'm not sure I would have gone into it if I'd have properly done my research up front. Um, but I was already halfway down the route by then. So you then find a supervisor and you sign up to the BPS to do kind of it's not really a training course. Um, it's more like you are out working as a trainee sports psychologist. Um, but you have um, lots of boxes to tick. You have many, many, many hours to show of the work that you've been doing. You have case studies to write. You do a large research project that's the equivalent of a PhD level research project. Um, and that takes most people around three years to do. OK, so unlike clinical psychology, for example, there's not the machine that's having a forward momentum as well and kind of keeping you on track it it sounds like it's very much just driven by yourself totally um so there are three routes you can take now um which has opened up since I did mine when I did it it was purely what we call BPS stage two it's called the QCEP um there is another route that's through BASIS which is often for people who've got more of a sport and exercise background rather than a psychology background I don't know that much about it, but it feels like that one has much more handholding. So there are workshops that you go to as part of it. I don't think you have to do the research project, um, but a lot of it will be very similar. It's about building up hours of workshops and one to one work and communicating and explaining sports psychology processes. And there is also another route that you can do called a professional doctorate. And there's three universities where you would do a doctorate but much more of a practical doctorate than you might otherwise do and you do that training alongside it so that so there's now three routes um, but if you've got a psychology background you're probably most likely to go through the BPS route but but it's not I was explaining to a trainee I was talking to today it's not about following a curriculum and there's no classes to go to in any way and there's no structure you create it so to me it feels incredibly difficult however when you come out the other side you are in an amazing position to to be able to do what you need to do so it forces you to stand on your own two feet and it forces you to make it work if it works so if you make it through the process you will be hopefully a really good sports psychologist because you've practiced what you've preached, I guess. But it feels like there is a niche in the market for someone having a more taught approach and a more formulaic approach that you know, A plus B equals C plus D, you know, and that you come out at the end. Or, or do you not feel, do you feel like this is part and parcel of becoming the sport and exercise psychologist? I actually think it is that part and parcel bit. So when I was going through it, I was probably very critical about it. And I can absolutely understand trainees' frustrations. However, this is not an easy career to have. There are not many jobs in sports psychology. I did actually write a blog post um, a few years ago trying to figure out how many roles there were. But I would guess there's probably... 100 employed roles as an applied sports psychologist so there's maybe 20 25 people that would work for um it's just changed its name it used to be the english institute of sport and i think they've become uk based now and they work in the national governing bodies so you might then work for I know, british athletics and you would be the sports site for british athletics so it's something like 20 25 people there 
Then you have people that work in, say, the main football clubs, premiership clubs, rugby clubs, cricket clubs. And then you might have some people that work for TAS, which is kind of um, talented athlete scheme that goes on within universities. That's it for like having an employed job where that is all you do and someone pays your, your salary. Many others are working in universities, teaching sports psychology in some way, and they will see some athletes on the side. And then the rest of us, there are there's three or four companies that take on sports psychologists. They do performance work, um, usually in corporate worlds, actually. So they'll often be working either in schools doing teaching or they'll work with big corporates, but they'll be coming from the sports angle. And the rest of us will run our own private practices. And so there are probably hundreds of people coming out of masters in sport and exercise psychology courses who need to decide, can they handle the fact they might basically be running their own business? Where are they going to go out and look for that work from? Um, so some may be very lucky and get into a, a paid role, but I have to say the paid roles don't pay very much. Um, I've seen some... I've seen some roles in premiership clubs advertised at around £20,000 a year for someone that's got seven years of training. So, it, And for someone that's got the potential to make them vast amounts of money. Amazing, isn't it? Yep. Um, and, and their arguments are, but someone will do it so we can get away with it. Um, but if you want to make a decent living you are probably going to have to be in applied practice, private practice on your own. And I think that means actually the training is probably right for that because you are having to figure out how to make it work. You are having to connect with others. You are having to network. And although it's then a really small sector and it feels like it should be very competitive, most of the time it's incredibly friendly and we're all send referrals to each other so if there's something I can't do I'm I've got many other people I can send it on to there's certain groups I don't really work with anymore because I'm not going to be a great psychologist for a 12 year old footballer and basically their mum and they don't want to hear from their mum so there'll be other people that I send on to and people that refer into me and other psychologists that I'll make connections with and we'll do work together um, and so it's it, it's really friendly and really helpful but that networking and those contacts are really, really important. Um, and so I think it's really important that actually the training reflects that. You need to go out and find clients. You need to work out how to market yourself. You're not going to be given, very unlikely, a role. And when you train, the BPS often suggests that you can go into a placement to do your training. And yet when I've asked, I put a little poll out on Twitter and 3% of people had a placement. Everybody else was, was finding a way to do it on their own. And so I think the training needs to reflect that. Absolutely. And is, is, there, is there a cohort at all? Or are you sort of being taken on individually throughout a year or throughout, a, you know, throughout the taught programme? So Basies has two cohorts a year, I think. So then you have more of that feeling that you're with other people and you, you get to share that experience, which I think is really helpful. On the BPS route, you just sign up and register when you're ready to do so. So you don't have that cohort in the same way. Um, but some people might well share the supervisor. And certainly when I supervise people, I have a group where they talk and they engage and you start to build up those contacts. I have a peer supervision group that I'm on where there's 12 of us who've all been qualified about the same time. And we will use that um, to find somebody else that might be able to help if there's a, a difficult situation going on or to be able to get research papers if you need them. So that's one of the other problems is that we're not within organisations most of the time and when you do the training you're not within a university doing the training and yet all the evidence you put forward in order to qualify must be evidence-based and so you need the literature but there is no way to get the literature so finding these kind of ways around it and being in groups and working with other people 
really helps helps you to find what you need. Sounds, sounds very stressful and frustrating. Yes, very. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know how you've done it. Like, hats off to you, hats off to you. And you said there that, you know, with the VPS route that you sort of apply when you're ready. That makes it sound like anybody can do it, but I'm sure that's not the case at all. What are the essential or minimum requirements? So you need to have is it a graduate basis for BPS membership and you have to have stage one and stage one is a master's in sport and exercise psychology. That is accredited. Then you also need um, an enhanced DBS check and you need to know that you or show that you've got insurance. Um, and then you need two references from qualified sports psychologists. So it, it does take quite a lot of information to pull together. Um, and alongside that, you also need to write your own plan of work. And that is a significant piece of work to figure out how are you going to do 2,000 hours of one-to-one -one work? How are you going to do 2,000 hours of research? How are, it's about 400 hours, I think, of dissemination, of CPD, of ethics work. Um, but it, it's chunky at the time to do, but it's really helpful for thinking about how do I go out? And get what I need and how do I try and make some money at the same time yeah and actually that's I think it makes it more formulaic and it makes you know which you know which hoops you need to jump through and I guess for anyone in any area of psychology it might be helpful to think about that, you know. So even if they're working, for example, in an assistant psychologist route, and they think, I haven't got time for research. Well, actually, if you committed to yourself to think, well, I've got to do 100 hours this year of research-based stuff, how are you going to do that? That's a really interesting and potentially useful idea. Yeah, and I would really advise anyone starting this process, when you think about the research bit, because it's so substantial, and I certainly, I felt like I was sulking a bit while I did a lot of it because I already had a PhD and I was then being made to do 2000 hours of research when I've already got a higher qualification. I was definitely not in a great place about doing it. But if you can think about what you would like your specialism to be, that's really helpful. So I think it's really important when you're looking at the hours you do training, you get a really good range. So there's certain sports I don't particularly like working in. There's certain groups that I'm not going to be brilliant with. But you need to know that. So you need to get a really wide range of age groups, of both sexes, of all the different sports. I think I've worked in 27 sports now. And that's really helpful for then going, which ones do I actually like? Which ones are good? Which ones suit the way that I work? Um, and really understanding all of that. But when you've done a little bit of that, to then be able to go, oh, I think I might want to specialise in this area. So if I've got to do a research project, I'm going to make it something that's worthwhile. And if you can make it in something that almost ends up as a product for you or the thing that makes you stand out, that's really beneficial. So I did mine in exercise addiction and technology and whether um, the use, the more you use technology, whether it influences your risk of exercise addiction in ultra athletes and I still use a lot of what I learned today um, and it has been incredibly helpful for making that a specialism of mine so on reflection I think it is very helpful it's just frustrating at the time but it's totally worth really diving in depth to a subject that might well shape your practice overall. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think with hindsight, I might well have picked a different area for my research than I ultimately did because mine was in physical health. And actually, uh, it's probably not an area that I work in at all. But I think because a lot of my uh, my postgraduate experiences before I got onto the doctorate were physical health, that sort of that was my interest at the time. But it certainly wasn't my interest by the time I finished. Um, hearing you talk about assisted tech, um, I work um, and have written in the media about orthorexia, which is where you're using um, you know, you're forcing yourself to jump through different milestones and you might be using fitness tech to kind of keep yourself happy and feel like you've attained or achieved. Um, I have a Fitbit 
it's hidden under this sling because I've broken my arm at the moment. Um, and even being able to look at how many steps I've done is tricky because I can't twi- I can't twist my arm. But um, I don't know if you know, <laughs> but um, recently Fitbit did away with all of their challenges. So Fitbit Bingo is now scrapped. Um, Fit and Workweek Hustle, you can no longer compete against people and for me that was one of the main appeals of a Fitbit so I'm thinking about getting rid of it to be honest you know but there's this competitive ethos even within wearing you know me and some of my psychology colleagues and friends I went to school with that are you know trying to be a bit steppier than the other but orthorexia and fit tech can become more problematic than that can't it it's a really tricky area and the whole area around any elements of disordered eating and over exercising because probably for 70 percent of the population need to probably eat healthier and move more and there are some policy elements that have been put in place that support that so calories on menus There is research that shows for those who are likely to be overeating, that is incredibly helpful. And I certainly know I will look and I will make different choices based on what I see. So for that group of people, calories on a menu are helpful and help with that decision making, the nudge process. For those who've had an eating disorder, they are really, really dangerous. It is an absolute prompt to get you back into that eating disorder mindset. And that that eating disorder voice in your head will use the calories it sees to totally, totally beat you up. And it's a horrible place to be. Similarly, with all the information you can get off your phone or your Fitbit, for some people to be a bit steppier than the others, really good. Um, To get the feedback can be very helpful. Others, really dangerous. And so there is this real mismatch between who uses what. And I will often advise my athletes not to use things like Strava because, and I've really found this when I did that research, that I work from an approach called ACT, acceptance and commitment theory. And one of the elements I love in it is values. It helps you work out what actually matters to you not the things that are just easy to measure. And our watch is never going to tell us what actually matters. Our watch will tell us what's easy to measure. And so we end up validating ourselves and justifying and thinking whether we're a good or bad person based on some measurements on our watch. Not, did I enjoy that run? Did I catch up with my friend who's been really miserable and now feels a lot better because we went for a run together? And so I'll often ask athletes to to go for naked exercise um, with no tech. They're allowed to wear their clothes. Um, But I want them to do stuff with no tech. I really want them to think about how do they motivate themselves? How do they enjoy it when it's not to do with what times or distance or even how many goals they've scored? And I do tend to work with a very specific group of athletes um, who all have performance anxiety. And they all have two traits in common. They're very intelligent and they're perfectionistic. I call them VIPs. And that perfectionism element means they're constantly trying to beat their watch or beat their friend on Strava. And it just becomes a really big hammer to beat themselves up with. Rather than remembering, why do I do this? I do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I want to feel fit and healthy. I did a workshop with um, a school on Wednesday night and we talked about motivation. It was so lovely because we were all filling in post-it notes and sticking them all over the place of different elements of motivation. And um, they were just like, I just love how I feel when I achieve a new skill. I love how I feel when I've worked really hard for an hour. Nothing that they came up with was, I like knowing I've done my 10,000 steps a day. Um, So I can absolutely see why challenges and calories and all that other stuff can be helpful for some people but for people that are already diligent and dedicated to their sport and exercise they can be incredibly harmful and they can rip all the joy out of what they do 
and I don't have an answer because yeah I I don't know how you you block some people from seeing things but I think it's really helpful for people to have the self-awareness of I am doing this is it helpful for me yeah I hear you absolutely it's really incredible and insightful thoughtful points that you've raised there and um it's interesting when when I was listening to you and reflecting that initially when I first started going weight training I would tell my watch afterwards that I'd done it I'd be like amazing like 45 minutes exercise cleverly well done um but over time because it was fiddly to do in a faff and my watch didn't automatically recognize that as exercise because it wasn't you know hardcore enough I just didn't bother doing it but I never bothered and but I still loved doing it you know I loved connecting with my personal trainer well I'm going to love doing it when I can lift weights again but um you know I was gaining so much more than I ever would have gained from my Fitbit thinking that would have been quite cool yeah I did an experiment a couple of years ago for I, I write some features for Cycling Weekly and Garmin gave me their very best model and I followed their training for a month and then I followed my coach's training for a month and actually what was really interesting was it was very similar and I would still get my coach's training even when I'm following the watch and some days they would be identical but I got so much more from having a coach I got that connection I got the feedback I got the chatting through things I got the um the understanding that I was having a really tough week work-wise and I had so much going on and there was no point me going out to do a two-hour run on the Sunday because my body just wouldn't be able to take in that training it was going to push against and very likely I would probably get injured or ill and so there is so much more you can get from a person than you are going to get from a watch feeding you things. There is for sure and sometimes some of the clients I work with are, um, who might still be in full-time education for example um, and enjoying exercise um, and looking ahead to you know successful athletes are really reluctant to have any sort of academic coaching because they see that as cheating but yet can get on board with the fact that athletes would have um, you know coaches but they can't feel that that's okay for them to almost get a bit of extra help with their academia how could people think around that yeah. I, I guess I I only see the people that come to me um, and they're coming for performance coaching and I get a lot of parents that will be saying can you work with my child on their sports can you sneak in some stuff around exam stress and I know the next month every under 18 that I work with we won't really be doing much on the sports side we will be doing it on the exam side but the techniques are identical so the technique I would use with an athlete or someone going through exams or a senior eye surgeon trying to do a really really tricky um, operation that's coming up they're identical there are lots of work around um psychoeducation understanding why your brain is sometimes giving you really unhelpful conversations going on um, and then working on how do you change those conversations in your head we'll be looking a lot at being able to self-advocate better lots at the self-talk that you're using lots at the values and why you might have those fears or those anxieties but you're going to work in line with your values anyway and then we'll build things like mental skills in so I think I do a lot with, with those athletes that have got exams coming up. It might be something like control mapping. What can you control right now? And what focus can you put on that? What can't you control? And how do you accept that you can't control it and be able to move on? Or things like what if planning. Every single thing you were worried about that's, that could happen. And, and especially the silly things. They always go, there's always a, I know this sounds silly, but it's like, that's what we want on there. Um, and then we put the, well, how are you going to prevent that happening? What can you do in the next few weeks? That means that's less likely to happen. But you know what stuff might happen? Because it does, and that's life. And what are you going to do in that moment? So that instead of your threat system kicking in and you not being able to think logically, rationally, that you are able to, to keep that thinking that you want. And I would use that exactly the same for someone who's got their first triathlon this weekend and is worried about what might be in the water below them when they're in open water swimming. 
through to someone that's got an exam that they're not sure they've done the right training through through to an opera singer that's got their first night coming up you'd have exactly the same techniques it's just matched to the the context or the environment that somebody's in and it's not cheating it's optimizing and you know doing yourself a favor I mean the amount of practice that athletes do so I work a lot with swimmers most of them are in the pool for like 15 hours a week I cannot understand why you would spend 15 hours a week in a swimming pool. I hate swimming. Um, And then not spend an hour a week doing some mental skills practice or really planning how you're going to behave when something happens in your race or to prep for that race fully. It's like the, the brain side needs regular, regular practice. But it's a tiny amount compared to the amount of physical activity that we tend to do. Absolutely. Just before we come on to discuss um, your amazing book that I'm listening to at the moment, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about amenorrhea. I don't even know if I've said that right. I think I might have done, yeah. um, which is where your periods stop. Um, and in sports people, it's potentially quite common because of the amount of exercise they're doing, the amount of calorie deficit and all of that jazz. But um what I get when I work with people who have that um, presentation as a result of eating disorders is that they'll say, well, it's okay for professional sport people. So why is it not okay for me? Um, And I'd really love your view on that, please, Josie. So it is not okay for professional sports people. It's one, really harmful to their performance. Two, they will end up with stress fractures long term and they'll plateau and they'll just get burnout. So they won't actually be able to improve anyway. Is that is it, are the stress fractures li- linked to bone density and, or, yes. um, you know, yeah. estrogen and calcium and all of that jazz? Yeah, for male and females. Um, and then third, it screws up your fertility long term. So there are many elite athletes who have had to go through IVF for to have their children. Um, and many who amateurs and elites who haven't been able to have children. So it it was almost seen a while ago, hopefully a while ago, as a badge of honour. You have trained hard enough that you don't get a period. So it was seen as like a, wow, that makes you almost elite. And certainly 10, 15 years ago, when I first started learning about it, it was definitely that kind of, look at me, I'm good enough, I don't get a period. We now know how harmful that is for you for performance and long-term health um it tends to be known as red s so it stands for relative energy deficiency in sport and it's often thought of as an, an accidental eating disorder so you are not actively trying to lose weight to change your body shape what most people do is they step up the amount of exercise that they do without matching that with the amount of calories that they need Um, And so it it is often accidental, but sometimes it will be. There are still some sports, particularly cycling, running, climbing, where there is this whole culture that lighter is faster. And so people will try and drop some weight to get faster. And the real problem with it is that that works for a short amount of time. So you've still got the strength you've built up, but very quickly you lose some weight and you are then able to go faster using that strength. And then you break. So for women, it will be that your period stops. For men, it will be they don't get a morning erection because their testosterone levels have dropped so much. And then over time, when that continues, you start to struggle with energy levels. Um, And the big thing that normally stops people in their tracks is stress fractures, particularly runners because you are not giving your body the hormones that it needs. You are starving yourself in a way, and then you are running up and down on bones that are getting very, very damaged. Um, so that, that's unhelpful for particularly an elite level, because you cannot progress. You will then be out for a while. And, and it's horrible, but I love the fact that quite a few elite runners have been talking about this and they will explain to people that they have had red S and why it is so dangerous. And and others um, celebrate getting their periods back. Um, I've had little period parties with clients where we're like high-fiving at the screen because they've got their first period in a few years. 
And it feels really odd, but it's so important. Um, and it's about then changing the culture in elite sport that it, we have to talk about this stuff. And I will talk about it with male coaches when I'm working with an athlete and I talk to their coach and I'm like, do you know whether they get their period? And they'll be like, ooh, can't ask a girl that. You're like, how do you know if she's healthy enough then to do this training that you're setting? We have to make it much more normal to be able to talk about those health markers so that we can make sure somebody is in the best place to do it. Um, and and we will we don't really want someone training particularly hard. We'll we'll cap what training somebody's doing at quite a low heart rate until they've had three periods back. And so it's it's not just about stepping up the eating. It can be probably a six to twelve month process of getting healthy again. So for elites, that's a year out of their career. We absolutely don't want them getting into that state. Um, but for for regular am amateurs too, that take so much joy away from what you do and it the big thing is it tends to curtail your social life because many of us get into our sport and then we join a club and that's how we get lots of our excitement and we go on training camps together and then suddenly your sense of belonging goes because you don't feel like you belong to that that group it's really harsh um so I think we need to talk about it much much more um and, and if you've got clients who are saying, oh, but elites are allowed to do this, they're not. Um, and more and more is being put in place to stop that. Great. Thank you so much for illuminating that for myself and for our audience as well. And it's really important stuff to hold on to that we're we're talking about with our clients. So your most recent book, baby, I think it's your most recent, is called The Ten Pillars. Um, and I'm currently listening to it on Audible and your voice is just amazing. I'm loving it. And you've got oh, a little bit of music. In I can't listen to well. it. <laughs> oh, I love the music bits. They um, That's the best part of writing an Audible book is that when you've recorded everything, they've got the most amazing database of every single piece of music you could ever imagine. And you get to kind of go, I really like piano and this and happiness. And they'll type it in and then you just get thousands of pieces of music to pick from and choose and play it in the background. It's like the most fun I've had in years. It's really fun. It's really fun. And I think it's the only other audio book other than Will Smith's. I don't know if you've ever listened to his on I um, love audio his book. book. His audiobook is amazing because he like raps in it, he's got music in it, he's got background, and it's like it's such a good audiobook to listen to. It is. It's also written uh, ghost written, I think, by Mark Manson, who has written. Oh, is it? I didn't realise it'd been some... ghost written. I thought he'd just done it all himself rather well. No, 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 no. He's he's written some fascinating psychology books, um, particularly around relationships, where again, in his books, he's almost um it's kind of half podcast where he's interviewed and worked with clients about their their sexual, their relationship kind of histories and backgrounds as he coaches them through. And so I was listening to Will Smith's book, loving it, but going, this is very well written by an actor. And I did think it, it was like, very well sense. written. It's and then having seen book. the more recent, you know, goings on um, at, the, yes. was at the Oscars, I thought, oh, there's a slight mismatch here maybe yeah um but I thought from a psychological perspective he just got the psychology of things and I was like listening to it going there's so many lessons in here about mindset and behaviors and yeah. and ways to go out and achieve great performance and I, I think the ghostwriter really cleverly pulled those out because it was almost like I wanted to circle the audiobook of going oh but this bit this bit's brilliant so Will's book's good, but yours is also very good. And um, one of the, I'm quite, I'm quite early on in it, but I am loving it. You um, interview Dame Kelly Holmes. Um, yes. And I think one of the bits that's particularly relevant for our sp uh, current aspiring psychologist audience is when she's talking about individual pursuits, but also the importance of the team approach. And I know, I think there was a quite high profile um, it might have been gymnast who was booted off a team for being too self-focused and she was like but it's an individual sport I don't know why it matters but Dame Kelly is saying well it does matter and actually the ability to think about 
others in your team and others in your industry, not necessarily as competition, but as an asset. I really liked what you were saying about that. Could you illuminate us in that area? Yeah. One of the f- when I do my intro sessions with new clients, I'll always ask, who's on your team? And, and most of my clients, to be honest, are, are individual sports. And they're like, well, I do an individual sport. And I'm like, no, I know, but who's on your team? Who's on your side? Who's got your back? Who are the people you go to when you're having a bad day, when you need to ask something about training, when something hurts, when you're feeling sad? And we'll really pull out kind of who is on their side. So many of them will have a coach, but it's like, oh, but I've got Fred at training and Fred always is a really good giggle. And oh, yeah, I've got a physio. I go and see if this thing's wrong. And yeah, there's a teacher at school who really seems to get me. And we really pull out. What are you part of? Um, And I think that's really helpful. And Kelly brought this home beautifully in a really sad section of the interview that I did with her, where she talked about in 2004, she was training with an athlete from another country and her coach and the coach had both of them and she didn't feel like the coach had her back she felt like this other athlete was the number one athlete and she was kind of slotting in and she was really really miserable she was self-harming and she said she had this realization that I I don't belong here and that's why I'm self-harming that's why I'm, I'm trying to find a way to feel something um and she changed coach she joined the GB setup And she went out to training camps with the other GB athletes. She said that was such a huge change for her. So she had the GB physio that she was checking in with regularly. She had a coach that was on her side. And that was the year she won two Olympic gold medals. And so I just thought that was, there's so much more behind it, but it's it's become her thing. So when she was still training, before she got her Olympic medals, actually, she created something called On Camp with Kelly where she would take younger girls, um, kind of late teens, and take them away to really understand it's not just about running a lot. It is about the nutrition, the hydration, the looking after your body, the strength and conditioning, the having people on your side, looking after each other. And she really built that up. And now she has lots of projects um, that pretty much started during lockdown, where she was doing exercises um, in front of her alapacas that she has um, to to draw people in but but I've got friends that loved that because they were like we're all doing this together it's it really helped and you absolutely needed that lockdown especially if you were living on your own of like you've got that solitude that loneliness and yet for half an hour a day you get to check in with all these other people and you're on and there were Facebook group where you're all talking about things and that connection is so powerful I think that's really important. I absolutely agree. And one of the things that some of my members have said on the membership is, God, I didn't realise how important everybody else would be, that actually I would genuinely care about their success and I would genuinely be concerned for them and you know, moved when things don't work out for them. And it's such an important part of any career. But, you know, this psychology career, which can feel quite individual, it's, you know, it doesn't always need to feel that way and it shouldn't feel that way. Right. Um, I Something I always talk about with athletes is that the Latin meaning of the word competition is actually compietra, which means striving together. So competition isn't about being better than everybody else. It's about using everybody around you to all be better. And I think we can have such a different mindset when we think like that, rather than it's me going up against 20 people for that role or me trying to show that I'm the best to do this. It's like if we all work together, we can do so much cooler stuff. And similarly, I use the example of if you're on the start line for a big competition as a 100 meter sprinter and your goal is to win and you look across and as you say, bolt, like, no chance what's the point you've given up before you've started whereas if you're on that start line and your goal is to get a pb to be the best you can possibly be on that day you look across and as you're saying bolt you're like yes i'm going to follow his heels i am going to do i'm just going to follow and i get to be in this competition with the best guy in the world this is going to be amazing you have such a different mindset you approach it differently you will do better and so 
so much in sport, but other parts of sectors too, are about winning and outcomes. And I am so focused on the more we try and win, the harder we make it for ourselves. Because suddenly there's a ton of threat. And threat, as we know, changes our physiology and it changes our mindset. If we focus on input, what can I do? What tasks can I do to the best of my ability? We are more likely to do well. And I think that applies just as much to us as psychologists. And it's hard because I love Sunday afternoons because the athletes I work with will message me about how they've done in their competitions. Or I'll scroll through Instagram and I'll see that somebody got third at a world championships. You're like, yes, they've done it. But it's actually then you also have to remind yourself that their results are not whether we have done a good or bad job. Actually, if somebody has to pull out of an ultra competition because their feet were in a total and utter mess because they've been out there for hours, that might be more success because they have learnt to understand their limits better than someone that has been able to override their limits and put themselves into hospital. So as a psychologist, I think it's really important to, to not be focused on that winning bit and even how our athletes do, what accolades they get. But it's like, how have I helped that athlete, yes, be successful, but be successful with their own values in a way that matters for them, not, again, coming back to the what does a watch or a measure say? And am I measuring my own success on them? Because that's steps and steps away from what we've been able to input. Yeah, I love it. And I'm a mother of two young boys, um, almost 10, they would say, and almost seven. Um, and the 10 year old, almost 10 year old will give the almost seven year old a head start because of course he's, um, he is, he's got a little bit shorter than the other one. And I'll watch the youngest, my youngest, um, do really well to begin with, until he starts to consider, where is my brother? At which point he looks over his shoulder slows back because he's almost like going backwards and it's like you've got to keep looking forwards you've yep. got to keep looking forwards because that means he loses the race every time because he's so concerned about yeah. who's coming from behind there is um in um, the book I wrote before 10 pillars it's called I can the teenage athlete's guide to mental fitness and in that I interview um, an athlete called Kath Bishop and she's brilliant to follow on social media for anyone. She's just got such an amazing perspective. And she's got a brilliant book as well called The Long Win, where she kind of re reimagines what success should look like. But when I interviewed her, and I've, I've known her for many years now, she talks about she did two Olympics in rowing where um, everything was on winning and they didn't win. That was all that was cared about. Which, which way were you going to go when you got on the plane home? If you won a gold you've got to go in the front of the plane otherwise you went in the back and then she came to her third olympics and it was going to be her last olympics because she's highly highly intelligent and she was going off to the foreign office to become a diplomat so she knew it was her last and she and her partner kath granger went with the approach of let's just see what's possible let's move away from this whole we must win let's see what's possible let's focus on the input everything they did with the what's possible approach and so in the final she was really conscious of I cannot think about the outcome because as soon as you think about the outcome in a boat you'll catch a crab and you're done for in Olympics it just takes one mistake and there's no chance so they she was just focused what do I need to do in this moment what's the thing in this moment to make the boat go fastest and they got a silver medal and so when she stopped trying to win she did brilliantly but the winning causes us to slow down, to look backwards, to, to panic and not do things so well. So I, I love the way Kath talks about it because it's always like, what can I do at this moment? And how do I stop thinking success is an individual result? Success is so much bigger than that. But sometimes we need that perspective backwards to be able to see that success for them was being able to focus on what mattered. Lovely. And I think that's, again, so relevant to our audience of aspiring psychologists right now, because you might 
lose your train of thought if you suddenly think about this answer could be the difference between getting offered a place, getting offered a reserved place or getting told thanks but no thanks. And so let's just think about making these moments the best they can be. Yeah. And I don't... Something I found can be really helpful with any type of interview element is thinking about it on a more balanced basis. So absolutely, it's lovely to be offered a place or a role. But it's also your career. And you need to know that it's the right place for you. And so being able to think kind of, this is just as much for me to see whether this is the right place. And and actually, if you know your values well enough and what matters to you and what you want to go and do, some of those roles you might be going for aren't going to give you that. And it's really hard to be really focused on what matters most, but you're going to end up in the right place if you do. So, so being able to be really clear and not give the right answers, but give the answers that, that are authentic to you will see you in the right place. And so the more you're focused in an interview then on kind of my values and what matters and how am I being authentic, not on do they give me a place or not, you are more likely to get the right places offered to you. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, just before we share the best ways to get in contact with you and connect with you, could you give us your top tip for reducing burnout in the psychology profession and on the way to getting to be where where you want to be oh goodness um this is a so hard because it is competitive and you do want to be brilliant and we're all in this because we want to help people live their lives better and that feels very important so you'd need to take it very seriously um there was one book that really changed my life called essentialism and it's a guy called greg mccowan who talks about when we are really clear what matters to us and what we want to do and we put in place some boundaries to achieve that we get to say no to a lot more things and those no's are normally the thing that when you wake up on a Tuesday morning and it's that afternoon you're like oh why did I say yes to that and they're the things we normally say yes to out of fear or obligation or guilt and when we say yes to those things that don't take us in the right direction we're basically saying no to the things that do because we're not giving ourselves the headspace to make the right decisions or to even go out and hunt. We, we might say yes to things that come to us, but we're not going out to hunt for the stuff that will actively get us where we want to go. And so I tend to have five filters that I work with with my clients that can help them make better decisions in that way. So they have less burnout because they've got more energy for the stuff they really want. So the filters, do I have the capacity or do I have the capability to do this well so they don't end up in stress? Will I enjoy it? Because life shouldn't be a struggle all the time. There should be some fun stuff too. Um, does it help me meet my purpose? And you'll come on to purpose in chapter four of 10 pillars. And that one's super, super crucial. And then does it meet one of my values? And we're never going to meet all five of those. I mean, amazing if we do, but very unlikely. But if you can have two or three of them in place when you've got a decision to make on something, then you're going to make far better decisions. And then you're going to enjoy what you're doing so it doesn't feel like such hard work. And then it reduces burnout or risk of burnout. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I found this fascinating. Where can people learn more about you and your work, Josie? Uh, so I have a web page called performanceinmind.co.uk um, and there's a section on there called Performance Zone that has lots of blogs and worksheets and things you can download and use. Um, I have the 10 Pillars of Success, which is 10 kind of psychological traits, characteristics that all the research and evidence shows make you more successful. So things like belonging that we talked about, gratitude, courage, confidence. And then each chapter has a, a person that you probably heard of that brings them to life and has really used that in order to be successful. Um, then I've got the teen, I Can Teenage Guide to Mental Fitness, which is designed for 
for sports, but people also use it for music and things, which is full of worksheets on on how to um, how to handle setbacks, how to be more confident. Um, and then I spend way too much of my time on Twitter. So I am Josephine Parry on Twitter and I try and put out lots of kind of activities and tools that people can use on there. Amazing. Thank you. And I'd seen on Twitter that you've not long recently done the London Marathon as well. So well done to you. Thank you. Yes, I think that will be the last marathon in a while. But we're going to focus on something short and less painful for a little while. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been such a privilege to speak to you and a pleasure. And I'm sorry I've kept you much longer than I advertised. Um, so thank you again. That's great. Just one thing, actually. Um, if anyone does want to get into sports psychology... Um, I have um, a clinic every Monday morning that's free sessions for people to book into um, to come and ask anything about kind of how it might work with their personal situation or kind of the training they've done to date. So you can find details about that on my website, but that's a way to get much more personal information on sports psychology. Ideal. Thank you so much. And thank you for illuminating this career, which sounds incredible, but also <laughs> quite tricky as well yes. at times. Cool. Thank, thank you. you oh I loved it I loved it I loved it I loved it um thank you again Dr Josephine and please please do follow her on all of her socials and if you are an aspiring sport and exercise psychologist do consider her clinic that she runs once a week too Come and connect with me on my socials, Dr. Marianne Trent. All of the resources we have mentioned in today's episode are in the show notes and in the description. If you're watching on YouTube, please do like and subscribe to the channel if you are watching on YouTube and listen out for the next episode, which will be available to you from Monday at 6am. Take care. So many tips and lessons to learn